Hello friends and welcome back. In today's program, we're going to continue talking about the subject of the gifts of God or the gifts of the Godhead. We've previously looked at the first gift, which was Jesus. And we saw in John chapter 3 and verse 16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why? So that those who believe on him should have eternal life. And I said that the second gift was eternal life. We defined eternal life using Jesus' words in John 17, verse 3, where Jesus said, This is eternal life, that you might know him in whom it be sent, that you might know, have an intimate relationship with God, that you might have an intimate relationship with your Creator. And I said that the purpose of the cross, when we look at it, was to restore us to relationship to God. Jesus went to the cross, he died, was buried, descended into the pit of hell, and rose again victorious to restore us to relationship to the Father. Eternal life is not just living forever, but eternal life is having an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. We're going to continue on today looking at some additional gifts, and these gifts are given to us by Jesus. But before we do that, let's go ahead and ask for the Holy Spirit's help in this program today. And Holy Spirit, I thank you for each person watching today, that you, as our teacher, our guide, Jesus said that he sent you to teach us, to guide us into all truths, to reveal the, his things to us, just as he revealed the Father's things in his ministry. So we yield to you, we yield to your teaching ministry, and thank you for speaking through me and touching each person watching this program. And Father, we thank you for all that you are going to accomplish, that your plan and your desire will be accomplished, and we give you all praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's go ahead back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and then we'll move on from there. In verse 1, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. And then, as I've said before, in if you are looking at a King James Bible, you will notice that word gifts is in italics. In the literal Greek, what this verse is saying is now concerning the things of the Spirit, I would not have you ignorant. And one thing that I would say is that in my experience, the majority of people seem to be ignorant of the things of the Spirit. God sent Jesus to restore us to relationship. When you look at everything that God has provided, when it talks about it, it talks about it in past tense. We can go over to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Or I apologize, 2 Peter chapter 1. And it says in verse 3, According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. But notice it says, his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Hath given, past tense. The provision was given before we even received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. You can look at other passages. For example, Ephesians chapter 1. When we look at Ephesians chapter 1 and... Verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And you can see, once again, he has blessed us. The problem, though, is we are not obtaining the provision because of our ignorance of the things of the Spirit. And what I've found when we're talking about the gifts of God, eternal life relationship is a gift. But when we approach our Christian life, we approach it with a self-centered focus. What do I mean by that? We approach it looking for what we can receive. We have a pain in our body, so we pursue God to remove the pain. We have a lack in finances, so we pursue God to fulfill the lack. It is all self-focused, not relationship-focused. When you are in relationship with someone, you want to know about them. 
If you have an intimate relationship with a person, you are focused not just on your needs, but you are focused on their needs as well. You are focused on the things that they enjoy. You are focused on finding out more about them, learning more about them. In our relationship with God, we have to turn our focus from self to Savior. We have to begin looking to Him. And I have found that the more that I become lost in His presence, the less my issues and problems seem to stick around. It is all about relationship, and that is the gift of God. But in developing this relationship, He has given unto us gifts. And we go back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Again, Paul said, Concerning spiritual things, I would not have you ignorant. Concerning things of the Spirit, I would not have you ignorant. In verse 2 it says, I know that you were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and that no man can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operation, but it is the same God which, which works all in all. I want to go back and look at the diversities of gifts. But the same Spirit is the Spirit that anoints the gifts. But what are these gifts? We said that the first gift we looked at was eternal life, which was provided through Jesus. And Jesus was the gift that opened the door to that second gift, eternal life. But in looking at our development and looking at these other gifts, we can go over to Ephesians chapter 4. And it says in verse 8, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. He's talking about Jesus here. So Jesus, when he was resurrected, he ascended to the Father. It says that he ascended to the Father. He led captivity captive. He gave gifts unto men. What are those gifts? If we go down a couple verses, in verse 11, it says he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. Why did he give those gifts? For the perfecting, for the completing, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher were given to edify, to perfect the church. If you look back into the Greek, one way you can translate this word edify is spiritual maturity. How would you define spiritual maturity? I would define it as a person who is grounded in the Word of God, as a person who has developed a deep, intimate relationship with the Father. So we enter into relationship by accepting God's first gift, which was Jesus. Jesus, God so loved the world that he gave Jesus so that those who believe on him could be restored to intimate relationship with their heavenly Father. And then Jesus gave gifts the apostle, the prophet, the teacher, the evangelist, the pastor, to perfect, to lead those who have come back into relationship into spiritual maturity, to develop them, to perfect them. But what we're doing now is we tend to look at the pastor, we tend to look at the, pre the evangelist, we tend to look at the ministry gifts as the ones doing the work of the ministry. Now, if you go back and think about this, the Bible describes the children of God as being sheep. Jesus is called the Good Shepherd. If you went into a sheepfold, it is not the shepherd who is having baby sheep. The sheep beget sheep. One thing, phrase the Lord has been speaking in my heart lately, is the, the phrase misplaced revival becomes messy. Misplaced revival becomes messy. What do I mean by that? What does he mean by that when he's talking about that? Misplaced revival becomes messy. Well, most of us, when we think of revival, we're thinking about having the Holy Spirit pour out on our church. In previous programs, and previous episodes, I've said that sin is an elevation of self. We want revival to come to our church, to touch our people, to draw people to 
our church. Do you see a problem with that? I was listening to a message recently, and the minister that I was listening to was talking about this revival in Indonesia. There were, you know, tens of thousands of people being touched by the Spirit of God in the churches. People were being healed. People were being delivered. People were being set free in the churches. But then he said that he heard the person who was leading these revivals several years later, and he said that the man of God announced that they were no longer experiencing revival in the churches, but revival had moved to its proper place because all of the people in the churches had learned to walk in the fullness of all that God had provided for them and had now taken it to the streets. You see, we have been given the Word of God. We have been given the Spirit of God. But because we are not taking time to ground ourselves in the Word of God, we are not walking the fullness of everything God has provided, so we have to seek God to give us what He has already provided us. In His mercy, He does give us. And that's one thing you'll learn about Him. He's extremely patient, He's extremely loving, and He desires the best for us. And that is why, like for example, with healing, the best and highest is for you to take the Word of God, to feed upon the Word of God, to plant the Word of God in your soul, give it time to grow, and produce that healing power in your physical body. But you may not have time for that. You may not have been trained for that. You may not have been taught how to do that. So in His mercy, He has provided gifts of healing, working of miracles, because he knows that we are human. You can go back to Psalm 78 and see how it talks about he remembered their humanity, talking about his dealings with Israel. Yes, his judgment was poured out, but it could have been much worse because he looked at them and he remembered their humanity. God is extremely patient and he loves us and he only wants the best for us. There is not a best, you know, there's not a single way that he will manifest things in our lives because he is interested in getting the provision to us and he will meet us where we're at. You don't have to become the perfect saint to walk in the fullness. I've seen people that you would not even, you know, expect anything to happen in their lives used by the Spirit of God because he is looking at the heart and his dealings with us are through the heart. He will meet you where you are and if you will humble yourself, if you will yield to him, if you will open yourself to his workings, he will help you grow. He will lead you to sit under a pastor who will feed you and teach you and guide you into spiritual maturity. But there are things you can do to quicken it as well. And one thing we have to do when we're looking at these gifts is we have to be careful because I have seen some people look at this list. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers and say there's a hierarchy in these lists. But he's listing the gifts. Each gift operates in its own way. There is some dependency, and we work together. And I came across this, this list recently that I'd, from a resource I'd looked at in the past, and I felt like the Spirit of God wanted me to share it with you. And so we're looking at it. The man who wrote this says, The prophet is to inspire the teacher. The teacher is to study the prophet. The evangelist is to continually remind us of the lost and dying world and its need for the gospel. The pastor is to show us that souls still need much caring for after they have been won. And the apostle, above all, is to inspire and lead the way to fresh conquest for Christ and the church. The whole goal of the gifts is to unite the body of God, the body of Christ. But unfortunately, we see this division. And a lot of it is because we have brought self into our service. We have brought self. You know, we lift up pastors. We lift up, you know, individuals instead of lifting up Christ. I said in a previous program, I talked about back when I first became a Christian back in the 80s, and an experience I had in church where a well-renowned minister had fallen. Our pastor was crushed. He got up, he canceled worship, he canceled teaching, and the church came around the altar and everybody was crying out and repenting. I was right there among them, but the, 
then years later, as I was looking back at that experience, I was thinking, I had never even heard that man preach. I was basing my reaction on another man's reaction to another man's sin. We need to become grounded in the Word of God. The Bible tells us that love covers up a multitude of sins. We are all human beings. We all will make mistakes. We all will stumble and fall. But the Holy Spirit is faithful and He will always be there to catch us, to lead us, to guide us. Jesus gave gifts unto men to perfect us, to lead us into spiritual maturity. But that doesn't mean we place all of the responsibility on them. And that's what we've been talking about in these programs. We are responsible to take the Word of God and get it into our soul to renew our minds with the Word of God. Now, when we look at this in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13, it says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, where they, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And I want you to notice something here as we're looking at this. In verse 14, it says, We henceforth be more, no more children tossed through, to and fro. And, and notice what he says here. It's, the, the wording is very interesting to me. Carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. If we go over to Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, I want to show you some things that kind of make us think about this. Carried about by every wind of doctrine. The area where most people make mistakes is in the area of the soul. In a previous program, I talked about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, um, and we'll just kind of look at this. We're laying some foundation here as we're talking about the ministry gifts. We're talking about looking at this. In verse Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it says, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body preserve blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your whole spirit, your whole soul, and your body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, as I've said before, the soul is the gateway between the spirit and the physical realms. When we are born again, we become a new creation in Christ Jesus. But our soul does not change and our body does not change. Our soul must be filled with the word of God. The ministry gifts that are given to us by Jesus were given to help feed us the word, to help sow the word of God. As we saw in Mark chapter 4 and verse 14, the sower sows the word. The ministry gifts, the teacher, the prophet, the pastor, they are to be sowing the seed of the word of God. Each one has a specific purpose in the church. And I don't know if the Holy Spirit will have us go through each one individually but the primary purpose is to sow the, the seed of God's word into the souls of those who are led under the ministry of the ministry gifts so that through the, the seed of God's word that has been sown into their soul, they will grow up into spiritual maturity, bearing fruit and reaching out to the world with the power of God. But here in Colossians chapter 2, thinking about this with it being in the mind and the soul, and again, when we're talking about the soul, we're talking about the mind, will, intellect, and emotions. So in Colossians chapter 2, it goes in verse 6, it says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. We're going to look at this a little bit deeper, 
as we move forward in these programs. But notice here, it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and de vain deceit. Back in Ephesians chapter 4, we saw in verse 14 that we be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. And here he's saying, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. That word spoil, we see it used again, the same Greek word down in verse 15. It says, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in that. When we're talking about that, what is he talking about here? Jesus, when he rose from the grave, he spoiled Satan. In the times that Jesus lived, in the times the Bible was written, when you spoiled an enemy, you captured their king. It is said by some that they would cut off their, their, their toes, their big toes and their thumbs so that they could never lead an army into battle again. They could never carry a sword again. And then they would march them through the center of town, chained up so all of the town could see this defeated foe. They had been spoiled. That is the same word used up in verse 8. Be west, beware lest any man spoil you, conquer you, defeat you. Through what? Philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You see, the goal is the, of the enemy is to turn our attention outward instead of upward. Our attention needs to be focused on the Word of God. And that's why in these programs you hear me talk so much about the need to meditate, give constant, continuous focus to the Word of God. Focusing in, allowing the Word of God to become deeply rooted in our soul. In the beginning, God gave Jesus. It is through Jesus we have been restored to eternal life, intimacy with our Father. In 1 John 4, 7, it tells us, as he is, so are we in this world. Our spirits are identical to Jesus, but our soul in our physical bodies we must do something with them. We must take the word of God. And that is important as we're looking at this and moving through in these programs. God gave Jesus. Jesus gave the ministry gifts. The ministry gifts are to train us to sow the seed of the word of God in our soul. You cannot do this in isolation. We all need each other. I operate in a teaching ministry. The anointing and the calling of my life is to teach the word of God. We will be stepping out. We will begin to conduct church meetings in the coming year. But I have a pastor that I sit under. I have a shepherd. I have seen a lot of people get in trouble because they think that they do not need to be in church. They do not need the fellowship of their fellow brothers and sisters. The Bible tells us that iron sharpens iron. He gave gifts unto men to perfect us, to lead us into spiritual maturity. Because he knows that the enemy is working and will send people to spoil us, to defeat us in the area of the mind. We've already looked at it, but let's just look real quick in the closing minutes of this program today. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In verse 2 it says, but I beseech you that I might be... Not be bold when I'm present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And when you notice this, and we've talked about this previously, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. All of the weapons of our warfare are designed to give us ability to pull down strongholds. Where are these strongholds? The strongholds are built in the soul. They are thoughts. They are intellect. They are doctrine. They are thoughts contrary to the word of God that spoil us, that cause us to be defeated. Just as Jesus spoiled principalities and powers, we become defeated, we become spoiled by the enemy by allowing our souls to have seeds of this world planted in them. 
by allowing our, our attention to be focused outward instead of upward. It says in verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought to the obedience of Christ. Your battle will always be in the thought realm. The enemy will come to you saying, well, you just, you've, you've done it now. You just, it's, it's all over now. You've, you've made too many mistakes, this and that. You cannot entertain those thoughts. You cannot allow yourself to entertain those thoughts. You must respond to those thoughts with the word of God. But if you have not been in the word of God, if you've not been spending time meditating upon the word of God, you will have nothing to respond to. Our time is up today. I thank you for joining me. Carol and I love you. We're praying for you on a regular basis. Please let us know if there's anything we can join with you in prayer. Send us an email to prayer at mbmediaministries.net. Again, it's prayer at mbmediaministry.net. So until the next program, remember that you can live life to the fullest, walking by the faith of the Son of God.